All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, again, apologies for the delay, uh, but I have assigned uh, temporary letter grades for all of you. Uh, you can figure yours out by there's an algorithm that you can follow. Uh, I've also uploaded the thing on Hub so you can double check to make sure uh, I didn't make any mistakes. Um, I also have blocked out a bunch of 10 minute slots in the next week or so for one-on-one -on -one meetings. If your temporary grade was D or an F, you should already have received an email from me. Uh, I highly encourage you to come and uh, talk with me. Um, even if you don't have a D, but you want to come and talk, please do uh, send me email. Um, so basically just go through this, you add the post and whichever slot is not stricken through is free. Uh, and send me email about which slots work for you. Um, any questions on the temp grade or midterm grading? Um, Steven. How many people got an A, uh, four? Any other? Uh, Dave, right? Yeah. How many people usually drop the class each semester? How many uh, kids dropped the class? I think last year it was around 10%. Yeah. Um, that's maybe 10 to 15. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, as a reminder, the deadline for the video is coming up. Uh, it's basically in about one and a half weeks. Um, for detailed instructions on what's needed, what should be done, in particular, how should you cite things and things like that, uh, please go look up the uh, project, uh, mini project webpage for the details. Uh, I also have a feedback form. Uh, please do fill it in. It's completely optional and uh, it's completely anonymous. Uh, in particular, if you have limited time, the first section is basically asking for feedback for things that we started just from this fall. So if you are limited on time, please at least give feedback on those items so um, we can at least get a sense for how things are going. Okay. Are there any questions on uh, logistics uh, before we start talking about technical stuff? Uh, Again, just as a plug for filling in the feedback, lots of the things that were new this year were either had been remarked upon in the previous year feedbacks or even last year. So uh, I'll try to incorporate as many as possible this year, but if for nothing, do it for the betterment of the fellow students who will come in uh, next year. And I'll wait for a week or two, and then I'll probably also put up a post uh, trying to address some of the common um, feedback um, that I get. Okay. Um, in some cases, I will respectfully disagree, and I'll give you my viewpoint for why I disagree, um, and then we can probably just agree to disagree and leave it at that at that point of time. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right, so uh, last time we proved the cut property lemma uh, and then we used it to prove the correctness of primes and then we very quickly went over the proof of Kruskal. So what I'm gonna do today is repeat uh, the statement of the cut property lemma and then we're going to quickly go over the proof of correctness for Kruskal's again. So here's the cut property lemma. Uh, we make an assumption that all edge costs are distinct. And in like 10 or so minutes, we'll see how we can get rid of this assumption. But for now, let us assume that all edge costs are distinct. <clears throat> then you look at any possible cut in this graph. A cut is basically dividing the set of vertices into two non-empty parts. And look at all uh, crossing edges. So these are edges that have one endpoint in one part and the other endpoint in the other part. And if you look at the cheapest crossing edge, uh, again, remember we have assumed all the edge costs are distinct. So the cheapest edge is always unique. And then the cut property lemma says is that edge is going to be present in all possible MSTs for that graph. As Alex has pointed out last time, uh, 
the fact that this is all MST is just follows from the fact that if you assume all edge costs are distinct, there is one unique MST. Uh, but to use this cut property lemma in proving correctness, we don't need that. We just need the fact that the cheapest cross, uh, it is always safe to add the cheapest crossing edge for any curve. So here's uh, the argument for optimality of Kruskal's algorithm. Uh, and let's say we're looking at the case where uh, Kruskal's is trying to add this edge from the red node to the blue node. And what we want to figure out in this case is what should be this cut S, right? Well, uh, which cut, for which cut should this edge be a crossing edge? And unlike Prim's here, the definition of S is not obvious. In the case of Prim's algorithm, S was exactly the S that was defined in the algorithm. So the way you define S is, let's say I pick this red part arbitrarily, and then the set S is the set of all vertices that are connected to the red vertex, but only using edges that you've picked so far. Okay, so it's important. You're not picking all possible edges. Only vertices that are connected to S using edges that have been picked so far in T. So that's my set S. And everything else uh, is the remaining. So this set S will define my cut. And now to make sure all the conditions of the cut property lemma are true. So S is not empty just because the red guy is in S. So by definition, uh, S is always connected to itself. So we are good over there. We want to argue that uh, S is not everything. In particular, there exists a vortex that is outside of S, and a natural candidate in this case would be the blue vortex, right? And so the argument for why the blue vortex is not in S is by contradiction. So let's assume for the sake of contradiction that the blue guy is also in S. So you have a situation like this. Again, remember, I have not added this dark edge, I'm considering to put it in uh, in my set T. If the blue guy is in set S, that means there already exists a path from the red to the blue guy only using edges in T. And so if I add this new edge in, I'll have a cycle. But remember, I'm only considering adding an edge if adding it doesn't introduce a cycle. So this cannot happen. So it necessarily has to be the case that the blue uh, vertex is outside, okay? So now I've satisfied the two preconditions. Uh, one and S is non-empty and V minus S is also non-empty. Any questions so far? <coughs> All right, so now to apply uh, the cut property lemma, we also have to argue that this uh, red-blue edge is actually the cheapest crossing edge for this, this cut. Okay. And the way we are going to argue this is to argue, well, this edge will actually be the first crossing edge considered by Kruskal's algorithm. So in particular, there could be multiple crossing edges between S and everything else. And since Kruskal considers every edge in increasing order of cost, if we argue that this edge is the very first edge that Kruskal considers, then by definition, it has to be the minimum cost. Okay. And the argument for that is also fairly simple. Let's say by some argument's sake that this was not the first crossing edge that was considered. Let's say it considered another edge where I guess this is purple, that's, uh, is also crossing, but if you picked a purple endpoint which is connected to some guy in S with an edge, by definition S would contain that vortex because it would be connected to S using only edges that are present in T. Okay. So this is the argument for why this red-blue edge would be the very first edge considered by Kruskal uh, in this cut. Okay. And that basically does it in the sense that, uh, right, and so as I said, we, we use the fact that we're using everything in increasing order. So this is the argument for why you can apply the cut property lemma and in particular argue that every edge that's added by Kruskal's is the cheapest crossing edge for some cut. And in particular, this implies that Kruskal's cannot go wrong by adding that edge. Okay. Are there any questions in this argument?
<clears throat> Why don't you talk to friends for half a minute? Let me know any questions. If not, uh, we'll move on. <clears throat> Questions on this? Blake. Uh, how long does it take to determine whether we can clear adding cycle or not? Uh, so Blake's question is on runtime analysis. We'll come to that in a few minutes. Yes. Uh, it's a very interesting question. The solution is non-trivial, uh, so we'll avoid doing it in class, and I'll give it out as reading assignments. Uh, any questions on this? Is everyone OK? If so, are we done with the proof that crystals is correct? How many think yes? Okay, how many think no? Okay, uh, I should probably clarify that no answer is not an option, but in this case, it's not. So, Mark, why do you think we are not done? We have to prove we finish. Right, so we have to argue that what we end up with is a spanning tree, right? So it's the same thing as prims, right? So uh, all we have argued is everything that's added by crystal in the run of the algorithm is fine. But again, that argument vacuously holds true for an algorithm that doesn't add anything. So we need to argue that the final output is indeed a spanning tree. And so the argument is actually turns out to be slightly easier than prims. So first note that by design there are no cycles. So we are good on that. So the only thing we need to argue at the end is everything's connected. And so if it is the case that um, the final output of Truskulls is not connected, that means there has to be a cut so that there's no edges in T that's crossing between uh, S prime and B minus S prime. And if there are no edges here, and the reason Kruskal didn't pick any crossing edge here can only happen if there were no crossing edges to begin with. Because if it were there, it will consider it, and then it's something that it can add, so it will go, go ahead and add it. Right? So the only reason this will happen is if the original graph G itself was disconnected, but that contradicts our assumption that the original graph is connected. Uh, so we are done. Right, so, and that completes the argument uh, that Kruskal's is correct. And so in particular, we are done with arguing correctness of prims and Kruskal's, except we still have this annoying assumption that we need to get rid of. Right, so we have assumed so far, in particular, the cut property lemma makes the assumption that all edge costs are distinct. So we want to get rid of that. Um, and there are multiple ways to argue this. So you can actually, what you can do is go back to the proof and revoke the proof for the cases where there are potential edge costs that are the same. And then you can actually rework the argument to argue that crystals and primes are actually correct. So that's one way to go about it. I'm going to talk about a slightly different way, uh, which uh, trick. Um, which is something that's useful when analyzing uh, algorithms in general, especially when you have weights involved. And many a times, and this was one of the cases, it's easier to prove something assuming all the values are different. Okay, so you start off with that. And then what you do is called a perturbation trick. So you argue everything for distinct costs. And then we just say, well, let's do this mental exercise for the case where the edge costs need not be all the same. And let's slightly change the values everywhere, like very, very minute amounts. So that you make now make sure that all the edge costs are distinct. 
Right, so what you're doing is you're taking an in input which might not have all the edge costs to be the same and perturb it slightly so that you can make sure that all edge costs are distinct. Right. If you do that, are we done? So what I'm saying is take your input which need not have edge costs being distinct Disturb them slightly so that the edge costs are all distinct. Then apply the argument that we've already seen and it works fine. Right? On this perturbed graph, on this perturbed input, the proof works exactly the way we have done. But would that imply that we have argued that the algorithm is correct on our original input? Matt. <laughs> right, so we are not done because what we have done is actually change our input, right? So it is potentially possible that the output also changes, right? For example, I guess the seventh true false question where it was like change all the edge weights and then does the shortest path remain the same? And we saw that it does not, right? So the crucial part of the argument is to then argue that the actual MST that you get for this perturbed input is actually also an MST for the original output. So you're taking input which has not all distinct things, changing it slightly, make it into a different instance where you know your algorithm works correctly. And then you argue, well, the output of the algorithm on the, the, this MST is also an MST for this guy. Let's try to make that uh, extra argument. And this is where, when I say very small amounts, it's pretty vague. I mean, what is small, right? 10, 100, 1 tenth, 1 million. So uh, you have to be careful about how small should small be, okay? So what I'm gonna do next is kind of walk you through one way of perturbing this and argue that things are fine there, okay? Uh, but are there, well, let's see. Right, so I said uh, the changes have to be small enough so that it works. Okay, maybe I should take a poll. How many of you are interested in seeing one way to do this? So rest of you don't care? Should I just move on? Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's walk through this. Uh, all right, so uh, here's, here's one way that works. This is not the only way to perturb the inputs, but definitely something that works. Uh, oh, by the way, I should clarify the use of the word trick, I am not trying to trick you. We are trying to trick an adversary that's trying to foil our proof, right? So it's, it's a trick in a good sense of the word. Um, and so here's what I'm going to do. So the main idea, and again, I'm not going to kind of fully work everything out, but hopefully there should be enough details so that you can work, work out the details at home, okay? So let's say I number the edges somehow, right? So I have M edges, let's number them from one to M and add to the ith edges cost an extra cost of i over 2nm. So it turns out for me this, this is small enough. Anything that's smaller than this would work. Okay, so I'm perturbing it. So again, think of n and m being large, right? Say, I don't know, if it's the, you know, um, Facebook graph or something, N and M are the order of millions. Right? This is really, really, really tiny. But this is all okay because I'm doing a mental exercise right now to argue that uh, on this perturbed input, the algorithm works fine. Okay? So again, so this is, so what this says is, in other words, if EI is my ith edge, so what I'm saying is, change the cost by adding it this like really small amount. Okay. 
So the one thing that you can now verify, but I'm not going to go through this, is you can argue that all edge costs are distinct. Okay. And the basic reason is, if two guys were had exactly the same value, because they have different i values, their costs are going to be different. If two guys were different, since I'm changing things by such a small amount, they're not going to clash. Okay, so the point is if I have two guys that were different, even if they were different by say one, then I'm changing them very, very with a small amount. So they're not going to overlap. Okay. All right. And so then the basic idea here is, and, and what is the bad thing that can happen, right? So I made sure that all the edge costs are distinct, so now I can apply my previous argument. But the worry is, since I'm adding these small amounts of uh, perturbations, maybe it's small for one edge, but if I add everything across an MST, it kind of pushes the weight over to the next guy. Right? So maybe in my original graph, the MST and the spine tree which had, which was just off from being an MST, the cost only differed by one. So it was really, really close, the total MST value. And it just so happened that even though you change each of the edge weights by really small amounts, they just add up and happen to move one over and coincide in this. And that's, the, that's the, essentially the issue. So what we want to argue is these values are so small enough that that cannot happen. Okay. And so the main question we need to answer is, how much can the MST cost change? And we're going to argue that it doesn't, it, it can change by something that's strictly less than a half. So even if you had two spine trees which had costs of one, you're not going to jump from one to the other. And to argue this, what do we do? Well, just let's look at the uh, edge costs in the MST guy, right, and just add them up, right? And let's just do a loose analysis. Let's just assume it so happens that you tend to get the largest n minus one edge costs, okay? So in the worst case, the largest n minus one cost edges are picked. Now, you can probably argue that even this worst case is never going to happen, but what I'm saying is nothing worse than this can happen. Right? So I'm saying, what is the absolute worst that can happen? And so that implies the total perturbation in MST costs is, well, what is the largest cost? When the value of i is largest, which is m, right? So this is m over two nm, plus m minus one over two nm, and I pick all the largest n minus one guys, because the n minus, remember, a tree has n minus one edges, right? So it's m minus uh, n minus two, like two. Okay. And note that all of these quantities, the numerators are, are, so in particular this, all of these quantities, if you sum them up, is at most n minus one times m over two nm. Okay. And this is strictly less than half. Sorry, and so this is what I wanted to argue. Okay. So talk to your friends for half a minute. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. If not, I claim I'm done with MST. So I've argued the correctness of Kruskal's and Prim's for the most general case. And if you're happy with that, we're actually also done with greedy algorithms and we're going to move on to the next kind of uh, divide and conquer algorithms. Um, next.
Uh, all right, let's come back. Man, did you have a question? No, I got it. OK, uh, Alex? Could I reasonably argue that this is logically equivalent to just using the i index, like the i index of the edge to resolve tiebreakers? Right. So uh, Alex brings a very interesting point. I meant to talk about this. Um, in many cases, you don't have to even do this perturbation. And this, what uh, Alex is suggesting, is the classic way you can assume when you're proving correctness of sorting algorithms that all the values are distinct, which is what you do is if, say, the ith and the jth value are the same, like say 10, then you replace i by 10 by 10 comma i and j by 10 comma j. And now you have uh, a, a tuple which are now different, right? So you can add the index and create a new value, which is a pair. And then now you can talk about them being distinct in when you do the lexicogra lexicographic order on pairs. And yeah, that's one way to do it. So you can also use that argument over here uh, to do it. Uh, the reason why I did it was this perturbation thing tends to be useful in a larger class of problems. Uh, and, and, um, so, but yeah, you're right. That, that's, uh, thanks for bringing this up. I meant to mention it, but forgot. Any other questions? Everyone good? Okay. So we'll move on. Oh, sorry, uh, we are not quite done. I forgot we have to go runtime analysis and come to Blake's question. So we're going to do runtime analysis a bit quickly. Uh, so for the first algorithm, we proved correctness for Sprim's algorithm. And as we had mentioned, the algorithm is pretty similar to Dijkstra's because you're keeping track of kind of the cheapest value across, across this cut. And so essentially using the same data structure and pretty much the same analysis, you again get an M log N runtime. Um, and indeed, it turns out that the analysis in uh, Prim's case is even simpler because it's directly dealing with uh, edge costs and the costs actually don't change. So all you need is a data structure where you can add values in they never get changed, and you only need to keep track of minimum. Right? And so that's, uh, that's what makes the analysis here slightly simpler than the analysis for Dijkstra's algorithm for shortest path. Um, oh, by the way, um, this reminds me, uh, if you are not sure, you should, you should convince yourself of the following fact, that if you create an MST for a graph, it doesn't tell you anything about the shortest path. So in particular, an MST is not necessarily the same as the shortest path tree that you would get from direction. Something to keep in mind and um, convince yourself at home. All right, so now coming to Blake's question of adding, a, how do we uh, quickly tell whether adding something will not create a strike? So of course we can show this in polynomial time. You guys, uh, I mean, it's not that hard to show that checking for a cycle is order m plus n time. And you're, you're running this entire loop at most m times. Since the graph is connected, order m plus n is order m. So m times n, m squared. So you can easily get order m squared. It turns out you can actually, if you use, uh, there's a beautiful data structure called uh, union find data structure that allows you to check for whether adding this edge will create a cycle in only log n time. Okay, uh, and I believe that's probably 4.6 or 4.5, one of those sections uh, in the book. So it's there in the book. So that's your reading assignment. Uh, and again, I want to stress, Clarify the reason why I'm not doing this is not because it's not interesting. It's beautiful uh, data structure work, but I just want to kind of move on um, to the next algorithm. Okay. All right, uh, any questions? All right, so let's move on. So uh, we have seen few iterations or this flow chart, so let me quickly walk through this again. So you start off with a problem statement, then you mathematically define it as a formal problem, you design an algorithm, you design data structures, 
and then you analyze both correctness and run time. And as I promised at some point uh, earlier in the course, we're going to look at three ways to go from problem definition to algorithm, or three kind of techniques. And again, I like to stress that these are not kind of like formal recipes, even though you can talk about how to formalize what it means to be a greedy algorithm. Uh, but that's something that we won't go into. We are going to go with this kind of, I don't know, like slightly vague notion of you know it when you see it kind of thing. So we are done with greedy. Um, not in the sense that we have covered all the possible greedy algorithms, but we have covered whatever I wanted to in this course. And before we go on, uh, how many of you know what is the significance of this picture? Tyler. Uh, okay, you can say, so this is by Benjamin Franklin, call it propaganda, but let me refine my question. This is a first in American history, so what is this a first of? It's first of its kind. Alex. Did it show this different colonies or states? Uh, no, it's not that it's your difference in colonies. Uh, Jared? Is it the first example of divide and conquer? Uh, is it the first example of divide and conquer? Actually, no. Uh, divide and conquer, actually, if you look at history, uh, the, way, uh, the, the origin of the phrase divide and conquer comes from a military strategy of where an aggressor is trying to take over a country, and if there are multiple people in charge of multiple areas, you divide all of them first, make them fight with each other, and then when they are all weak, you go in and conquer. And this was a very well-known technique for, uh, that British used to take over uh, multiple uh, countries. Uh, in India, when we were young, this was taught, drilled into us in history lessons, like that's how the British took over India. Tyler. Yes, it is indeed, sorry. But, all right, so the answer is this is the very first political cartoon that was ever published uh, anywhere in the US. Um, but indeed, so this leads to this whole process, uh, the algorithmic technique of divide and conquer. And as I said, uh, even though the origin comes from uh, military reasons, uh, there is no military stuff involved in what we're going to do. It's just we're trying to conquer the problem. That, that's, that's our goal. And so here is kind of, and again, this is not a formal definition, but kind of rule of thumb, uh, three-step process for a divide and conquer algorithm. You first divide up the problem in at least two subproblems. So you have a larger problem divided up into smaller problems. Uh, the easiest thing to try is two, but we're going to see examples where divided into four, three. Um, there exist examples where you divide into nine, prime squared, all kinds of funky stuff, but you're not going to do that. Um, then the idea is this is where recursion really plays a really, really strong role. What you have done is you divide, when I say divide the problem into sub-problems, what I really mean is it is the same problem as before, but now my input size is smaller. So say I start off with a problem on an array of size n, I'll divide it into two problems of size n over two. So the crucial part is it is exactly the same problem, but the input size has decreased. So this naturally leads to say, well, just let's solve it by recursion, right? And of course, there's a base case, almost invariably the base case is trivial. You do some brute force algorithm because the base case is of for constant size input. Okay. And typically, the hard work is, all right, I, by recursion, I've solved this sub-problem, say, at the very top level. How do I combine these to solve my original problem? And typically, though not always, that's where most of the ingenuity in divide and conquer algorithm comes from. So the problem we're going to consider is something that you guys really, really know well. Uh, is the sorting problem, right? And so let's say you're given n numbers and you want to order them in increasing order, say from smallest to largest. Um, there are many interesting variants. We're going to assume that there exists a total order. That is, if I give you any two elements, you know for sure which one is strictly smaller than the other. Okay. Um, so it works for, so this is definitely true for integers. If I give you two integers which are different, one has to be smaller than the other, but you can just generalize this to saying as long as any two uh, elements are comparable, all of the sorting algorithms, or pretty much all of the sorting algorithms work. 
How many of you have seen insertion sort before? Okay, but not everyone. So, all right. <clears throat> so here's a classic uh, algorithm to solve the sorting problem. And again, so my input is, let's say, n numbers, a1 to n, let's say they're in an array of size n. Uh, and we want to make sure that at the end, I output n numbers that they're all sorted. Again, ordered from smallest to largest. Okay, so let's say my output is b1 to bn. And the idea in insertion sort is very simple. You, what you do is go through the list, find the smallest number, put it on top of your output. You have n minus one guys remaining, find the smallest in that, put it in the second thing, and so on and so forth. So at the end of the ith iteration, you have the ith smallest guys present, and then in the next round, you figure out the i plus one ith smallest guy and put it in there. Okay. So for example, if let's say my input A was actually sorted in completely different order, you're going to sweep through this entire thing, figure out that one is small. Uh... Oh, sorry. I think I talked about some other, sort. I think I talked about selection sort, sorry. Uh, all right, so insertion sort, what you try to do always is make sure that at any point of time, the first I guys are sorted. So let's say I have already sorted the first I guys. You look at the I plus one th guy and figure out where it should go if you had all the I plus one guys sorted. Right? So in this way, you start off with four, and if you only had the number four, then just the number four by itself is in sorted order. You pick three, and then you realize it has to go above four, so you move it down. You pick two, you figure out it goes on top, you have to move everything down, and so on and so forth. And it turns out that the worst case input for insertion sort is this reverse sorted order. And so this actually takes, uh, so the way you want to analyze this, for example, is you want to figure out the correct, if you already have the I guy sorted, where you want to figure out the I plus one th guy, you need to figure out where it should lie. And since these guys are already sorted, you can do binary search and figure out where it should go. Uh, it turns out the more work happens when you have to shift things. And in the worst case, you might have to do O of n amount of work. And since there are n iterations, this is O of n squared. And the example that I said where the input is reverse sorted actually also shows that it's omega n squared. So in the worst case, this is a theta n squared uh, sorting algorithm, which is not good. Uh, so as I said, by mistake, I told you about selection sort when I started off. That also is n squared. Uh, there's also bubble sort where you just compare consecutive guys. Um, and it turns out that in certain uh, computational models, uh, some of these algorithms are better than things like merge sort that you might have seen and things that I look into. And those things, I, this was a hot topic maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago where there were issues on how many times you could write to a flash drive, which no longer is an issue. But if you had issues with how many times you had to rewrite into the thing, then I, I believe selection sort was much better than uh, doing merge sort or any of these n log n time All right, so we'll, how many of you have seen merge sort before? Okay, how many of you have seen the proof of correctness of merge sort before? Okay, how many of you have seen the order n log n runtime analysis of merge sort before? How many of you saw the analysis via recurrence relation? <coughs> Uh, how many of you saw the n log n uh, runtime analysis via recurrence relation and s solving the recurrence relation? Okay, so then whatever I'm going to tell you is going to be interesting for almost all of you, which is good. All right. So first I'm going to talk about uh, merge sort since most of you have already seen the algorithm, I'm still going to rewrite to you, but I'm going to fit it in this framework of dividing into sub-problems and solving. So here's how, so again remember, first uh, step is divide into smaller sub-problems, second is recurse, third is combine everything back. So here's how we implement this kind of rules of thumbs for merge sort. You divide the array into half. You have an array of size n, just break it up in the middle. Now what you do is sort both halves individually by recursion. 
once all the recursion goodness happens and you have these two sorted uh, subarrays back, you want to combine them into one sort. Okay, so that's what you want to solve. So again, you need base case. So let's say I stop at n equal to two or three or one, I forget, but some small number is good. And the base case, you can just solve it trivially. Uh, but you still need to solve the problem of, I give you two halves that are sorted by themselves. How quickly can you combine them into one sort of Now you say, well, I know there exists some sorting algorithm, maybe not merge sort, maybe heap sort or something that does it in n log n. So you can indeed merge two sorted lists into one sorted list in n log n time, but then you're not using the fact that the original two sub things were already sorted. Okay. So what I'd like you guys to do, talk to your friends uh, for half a minute and I claim you can do this in order n time. If I give you two lists of size, say roughly n or n over two, I guarantee to you that both of these are sorted. You can combine both of them into one array of size n, which is also sorted, but now you'll only take order n time instead of n log. And this is crucial. If you can't do this in all of n time, merge sort will not be n log. Any question, Tyler? Uh, Tyler's question was all the same. So you can assume they're both like n over two, but the linear time actually works even for arbitrary size. If I have one of size n, the other of size m, I can solve, combine them in order m plus n. Uh, but in this case, for most sort, we'll assume that they're roughly the same size. Uh, any question, other questions? If not, any suggestions on how to do this? Jared? Jared, right? Okay. You just compare the small to the two arrays and then whichever one's small you can Right, so let's say I have my arrays and I'm going to use my uh, fingers and kind of move my hand around. Uh, but let's say it's sort, so you think of the two arrays as columns and they're like smallest to largest in this sense. You put an index to the smallest guy in both cases. Let's say this is smallest move this to the output and move this index on. Okay? And you keep on this doing the same thing. Now say if this is smallest, move this to the output and move in. So at any point of time, you're looking at kind of the, the top of the two lists that you have not considered yet. Whichever one is smaller, move it to the output and increment it by one. Now it could happen, let's say if all of these guys are smaller than this guy, you just go da 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 da, -da and you're done. And then you have these things left over, you just move them n mass at the end and you're done. Okay. Uh, so this actually is there, I believe in, I think in uh, chapter two, uh, it's called the merge algorithm. Uh, so if you've not seen this before, don't remember, I encourage you to go ahead and look at it. It turns out that this is a very versatile algorithm, even though this is fairly simple. Um, it turns out in databases, this is a very quick um, algorithm to kind of, you want to join or kind of merge to lists, which is a fairly common uh, common operation. Not only that, you can prove really, really strong and nice properties about this algorithm. It's not only that, uh, so 
let me quickly tell you the nice property that I'm going to maybe talk about at the end of the course again. But let's say what I want to do is uh, I give you, uh, I, so I give, I'm giving you two sets and I wanted to find the set intersection of those two guys, right? But they are not sorted, right? And now it turns out that, you know, let's say if all of these guys are smaller than all of these guys, right? I only need one comparison to argue that the intersection is empty. I say that the largest guy in this list is strictly smaller than the smallest guy in this list. So there can be no guys in common. So with just one comparison, I can say for sure that the set intersection is empty. On the other hand, if it's something like Kirill interleave like this, then I have to compare this with this guy, this with this guy, and so on and so forth. So you have to kind of do like linear number of comparisons to certify say the intersection is empty. And it turns out you can generalize this and say you can define that the difficulty of my set intersection is what is the minimum number of comparisons I need to make to certify that the output is empty. And it turns out that this merge algorithm will be able to solve it in time which is only log n worse than this thing. So not only is it good in the worst case, it can merge to listen order and time. In some sense, if what you're interested in set intersection, it's kind of the best you can do for every instance. So not only is it good in the worst case, it's good for all instances. Um, sorry if that was a bit quick. I'll come back to this. I'll try to explain it a bit more detail uh, at the end of, uh, uh, of the semester. All right, so here's the merge sort algorithm. Uh, so again, your you know, input is A, and you have N guys. The base cases are if you have only one element, you just output that element. If you have two, output the min followed by max. And then you divide into two parts. There should really be floor of n over two. I couldn't quite figure out how to do it in PowerPoint, so just assume that it's floor of uh, two. And then you call merge sort on the left part and the right part, and then you apply this merge algorithm that we talked about. So you have two sorted arrays of size n over two, just kind of move the arrays on. <clears throat> so here's an example run. Let's say I have uh, n equal to eight. Uh, so I divide into two parts. I recurse on the left half. I divide into two parts again. Now I'm in my base case. So I'm going to put, let's say when I apply my base case over here, uh, one goes first, which is the smaller than 51. I apply the base case on the other guy. Other guys I have 1900. Now I have two sorted arrays of size two. I use merge algorithm and merge it into, uh, sorry, what? I have no idea what's happening. All right, sorry, okay. And when I merge it, then this is the sorted uh, thing for four guys. Then I go back to recursion in the later half, divided into two parts. Uh, base case two eight is the same. Base case for four three is three four. I apply merge and I get two three four eight. And then I apply merge to this and get my final sorted out. Okay, and this is another way to see that this is n log n you basically have log n levels, and in each level you're doing linear amounts of work. Okay, so that, that's one quick way to see this is n log n, but we're gonna argue this more formally next time. So here's the uh, argument for Kretner is actually fairly trivial, and it turns out that for most divide and conquer algorithms, the argument for correctness just kind of follows as, as soon as you have the correct algorithm, it just follows by induction. Okay. So this follows by induction on n. So again, uh, <clears throat> for the base case, it's correct just because it's the base case for one guy, that is the right thing. For two guys, the min should be followed by max. And then by inductive hypothesis, let's assume the merge sort works correctly on size n over two. Now you have two sorted lists of size n over two. Then the inductor step just follows by the correctness of the merge step. Right? And this is why the, in most cases, in divide and conquer algorithm, this is where most work goes. You have to figure out the correct patch of phase and then argue that the patch of phase is doing exactly what it should. Ah, so I am done. I guess this is a good time. I'll see you guys on Friday.